Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I've got a very cool guest with me today, and uh, this guy is so prolific as a guitarist, multi-instrumentalist, and a producer. I was just telling him he's actually challenging me for energy. Uh. It's tough, because I'm a pretty energetic guy, and it's only 8.30 in the morning in LA where he is. So we're with Fernando Perdomo, and a uh, qu couple of quick announcements. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe and subscribe to the audio and video. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, hit the subscribe button and the bell. All righty, let me tell you about Fernando and let's get into this because he's got a lot to say. Uh, Fernando Perdomo, an in-demand producer, singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist based out of LA. He was inspired musically by the eclectic record collection he put together at an early age as a regular customer in every thrift store and flea market in Miami. He also owns and operates Reseda Ranch Studios in Reseda, California. Some of his current producer projects include folk legend Linda Perhax. Did I pronounce that last name right? Perhax. It's cool. Perhax. Linda Perhax. Dean Ford from Marmalade. That song is yes. one of the most beautiful songs ever written. It is. Uh, and I got the performing with him a bunch of times, and it was incredible. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. And that's of my life is, yeah. is, is incredible. And he was a, an amazing person to work with. Unfortunately, he's passed on. Oh, but man. I did, uh, I did, uh, I, I did his, uh, his last true studio record, uh, Feel My Heartbeat, which is an incredible record. And his voice was absolutely incredible. Yeah. Even the incredible. guitar solo on there was really, it's a short little guitar solo. It was great. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, Junior Campbell was a guitar player in the Marmalade. And he was, uh, you know, Hendrix loved that band. Uh, I didn't know that. Favorite bands, yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. Uh, all right, Dean Ford, Rebecca Pigeon, Christina Vane, Jacob Jeffries, ex-Norwegian, Dave Kersner, and others. He's done TV music for Honda, Target, McDonald's, Goya. Did that make everybody back home in Miami proud that you did a Goya <laughs> commercial? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've been eating uh, Goya. I've been, been, I've been raised on Goya, so it was really cool to, to do Goya. <laughs> I, wish they would, I wish they would pay in, in, uh, in, in products, too. I wish they would send me, like, you know, care packages. <laughs> 20 cases of black beans or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't mind. That would be awesome. That was a lot of fun. And uh, TV music is a blast because, number one, you're under pressure. You got to turn it in, like, they say, end of day, EOD. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's do or die. I mean, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta come up with the right music for the spot and hit all the marks and hope that they edit it right. And, um, I've been very lucky with that. And, uh, the absolute pinnacle was when I did a Honda commercial and they actually used one of my songs, an instrumental of one of my songs called delight. And it was just like, yeah, that's it. That's now awesome, man. Now it's real. You yeah, know? that is awesome. Uh, he's also done commercials for Toyota, uh, Shameless, and Dexter. Um, yes. Dexter, the TV, the TV series? Dexter, the TV series. Um, How did you get in that? That's pretty cool, man. Um, I did a bunch of library music when I was in Miami. And I did a, an album of like cool, like white keys, black stripe, blah, 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 white stripes type, um, you know, garage rock. And I think some of the producers decided that one of my songs was the perfect soundtrack for a uh, dismembered arm. Awesome. <laughs> you know, oh, this, this definitely sounds like a dismembered arm being found. And it was used in an episode called uh, um, Talk to the Hand, which was really cool. Did you get to see them filming that? Because if I remember, it was in Miami. That's one of the weird industry, industry secrets. It's filmed in L.A. The oh, external shit. Wow. External shots are Miami. Uh, I remember somebody when I was in Miami, they're like, you know, this Dexter thing, it's not really in Miami. I watch it. Every time I watch it, it's like, oh, that's the Pacific Ocean. Wow. That's interesting. So, what do you, so how did they just come and film in Miami to do external shots? External shots, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I really thought all it was in Miami. In LA. But, you know, it is. But, I, but you know, I always used to wonder, this is, I, and I thought, man, Craig, you're the only person thinking this. How come they were never sweating? Because they were always out in the sun. And I would actually think that because I'm like, wait a minute. It's we'll be magic. Yeah, man. That's what it is. Yeah, I learned something it. every day. Uh, last year, Fernando joined the Dirty Diamond as a band member and a very cool alt rock band. Uh, as a guitarist, his recording and touring credits include Mexican pop stars Christian Castro and Paulina Rubio. International singer-songwriter Mika, Sam Moore from Sam and Dave, of course, Frankie Negron and Dave Kersner, amongst others. 
He performs annually on the Cruise to the Edge, which is a prog rock music cruise experience, and he does that as a guitarist for the Dave Kersner Band. In 2019, he also performed on the cruise with his own band, Out to Sea. He's released, dig this, 10 solo albums in the last three years alone. Let's let me say that again. 10 solo albums in the last three years alone. So anybody who says, I'm too busy to release a record, maybe listen to this. Uh, in, including uh, three instrumental prog rock albums with his own band, Out to Sea. He was featured on the recent movie, uh, Echo in the Canyon. He was featured on the album and the film that came out in 2018. Besides releasing albums under his own names, he also has pseudonyms, uh, 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 amongst others, Encino Evil, The Black mm -hmm. Galaxy, and Stones. Yep. Um, and lastly, a visit to Abbey Road Studios in July 2018 prompted him to release an album called Zebra Crossing. And I'm sure we'll get to some of these things during the conversation. And one quick thing he just told me that I wanted to pass along to you. Fernando just told me he is on a subscriber of a YouTube channel called Terminal Passage. And man, why don't you describe it? Because it's like you listen to the music. Every day they upload full albums that are not available on streaming services or CD. And we're talking about the most obscure fusion, uh, progressive rock, psychedelic rock. And it's amazing. And they always have full credits. And uh, it's everything from like Japanese prog to uh, bands from like Czechoslovakia and all over the world and Ethiopian music. And man, every day, it's blowing my mind. I mean, and there's some familiar names like Lee Rittenauer and Herbie Mann and Wishbone Ash and stuff like that. But then you'll discover stuff like Mythos and uh, Ryo Kawasaki and uh, all this really, really crazy, crazy music that I've never heard of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Tarika Blue and uh, McCoy Tyner, uh, some of his like weird fusion stuff. And uh, man, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's called Terminal Passage. So if you're into Terminal new music or getting turned on to something cool, just check it out on YouTube. Oh, yeah. All righty. Uh, man, let's get into this because I got a lot to go over let's here. Rock. Uh, give me, you've been doing this. You've done a lot in the last 20 years. But how did you first right. get started in the music business? And like, what was your first kind of break? Music business. Okay. Well, um, I'm from Miami, Florida. Miami, Florida is a really cool town to visit, a really strange town to be raised in. Um, <laughs> I was, um, I was raised in a, in a, uh, a, a musical household and uh, I was always attracted to guitar and uh, I guess we'll get to high school later, but right after high school, I um, immediately was in a position where I told my mom I wanted to make money with music and I could, and if I proved to her that I could make a living with music, I was going to take a break from, from uh, college. After my dad passed, I was like, I want to take a break from college and I'm going to prove to you that I can make money with music. So immediately I went to the yellow pages at the time. That's so funny. Wait I a minute. Up For anybody so that doesn't know, <laughs> should we explain the yellow? I don't think my audience so is that young. Before Google, there used to be this big <laughs> book that you would have that would have uh, there was the white pages that had individual numbers and that's where serial killers would accident would, would like open it up <laughs> and, and hit a name and be like that person's dead this week yeah. whatever so, okay so then there's the yellow pages where you would open it up and you would go to like you know uh if you need to get your fridge repaired you go to fridge repair yeah fridge right repair. um well <laughs> i opened it up to recording studios and i saw this thing called real sound recording studios and i called them and said Hi, I'm Fernando Perdomo. I'm a session guitar player. If you guys ever need a guitar player, give me a call. Later on that day, I got a call. And it was this guy, uh, Chris Rodriguez. And he says, want to come and do a session tonight? Like, Not yeah, Chris so Rodriguez, the guitar player, is it? No, Chris okay. Rodriguez, a.k.a. C-Rod, who is a producer in Miami. Okay. And he's like, hey, can you play uh, flamenco guitar? I'm like, sure. Hang up the phone. I'm like, ah, oh. you know. Make sure my classical was good. Did all the, <laughs> and I was like, okay. I showed up to the session, 
and it's this kind of cool little dance tune. And uh, I he wanted like flamenco strumming and some lead stuff. And uh, he's like, so what do you think of the song? I'm like, the song's really good, but the singer's really trying to be Jennifer Lopez. And everyone starts laughing. They're like, that was Jennifer Lopez. I'm oh, like, my no God. Way. That's and so funny. That, that uh, at 21, I played, uh, no, at 20, actually. I was 20. I played on a Jennifer Lopez track called Ain't It Funny. Um, and it was the remix that came out on the single. And it's called uh, Ain't It Funny. Um, radio traffic remix and that was my first credit like real big credit so immediately jennifer lopez and so uh, you okay. just let me just get this straight you cold called yeah was that the only studio you called or did you call like 40 oh, studios I called I a bunch and oh I okay a lot of work and uh um another guy that i called another place i called was um crescent moon studios which is uh which uh is uh the estefan studio so okay. estefan and uh, I got a call back, and uh, it was a, uh, um, a guy named Nicholas Tovar, who is a songwriter, and he says, hey, um, I'm a songwriter, and I work at Crescent Moon, and I'd like to see if you wanted to come in and play guitar on a bunch of my songwriting demos. This is a big one. And uh, I'll never forget the shock on his face when I showed up with five guitars and a big ampeg uh river rocket amp and a pedal board and he says what's all this i'm like this is my recording stuff and he's like oh i was thinking you were going to use a pod and i'm like no let you know I, I don't really do that um this is my my recording gear do you mind if we set it up and it's like well it's a really tiny room i'm like okay we'll put the amp in the corner and we'll throw a, we'll throw something over it and that day I recorded guitar on 10 demos at 50, at $50 a song. And uh, one of the songs was called No Se Falta. And he says, oh, this one's probably going to go to some other singer and, and, and whatever. A month later, I got the call that changed my life. It was Nicholas Tovar. And he said, Fernando, the song No Se Falta? which means uh, it's not necessary. Funny, it's funny. And that's not necessary. Talk about gear, you know. Uh, <laughs> he he uh, says, Christian Castro is going to record that song. But the reason I'm calling you is he loved your guitar playing and he's going to keep your guitars from the demo. So you got the a master Pro credit now. In the age of Pro Tools, all he had to do was re-sing the vocal and the demo became the basis for the track. Wow. And I'm like, whoa, I'm going to be on a Christian Castro track. That guy, okay, so Christian Castro is one of the biggest Mexican stars of the world. And he's been called the Mexican Steve Perry. Okay. Uh, he has a very high tenor. And he has a, um, a bad habit of hitting the highest notes he possibly can every song. And his songs have been huge. Well. No Hace Falta became a hit um, almost immediately. And he said, can Fernando come in and play guitar on the rest of the record? Wow. He wanted the rest of the record to sound like that song. Now, at the time, um, I was using a 82 Fender Tele uh, uh, Furlerton first year 52 reissue um, into my pedal board, which is the main, the main pedal I always use for distortion is a uh, Jekyll and Hyde by uh, visual sound. They're now yep. called true tone. Yep. And, uh, that's the sound of that track. Basically, uh, he wanted it to sound like David Gilmore meets Brian May. Mm -hmm. And most of the track actually sounds like a David Gilmore thing. And then on the bridge, I did like five harmonized Brian May guitars. Mm -hmm. And I think I did that on my last call. And that was really cool. Well, I ended up cutting the rest of the record with Gloria Stefan's band. And a lot of it was done at Criteria Studios. Wow. And I played a guitar on it. I played theremin on it. I played a bunch of really cool stuff. And uh, next thing you know, I was asked to tour with him. Now, this is, this is, this is a little bit of a, of, a, of a, if I would have done it all over again, 
I would have done select shows with him and not become his guitar player because I think he got tired of me because I didn't play on any more records for him. Because I wish he became I a commodity and it was too, it was too familiar, maybe? Too familiar, I think. Um, uh, I'll never forget, like, I had long hair. I had uh, pretty much my, my, my current life. Um, <laughs> no, I had long hair. And I'll never forget when his, his uh, Christian Castro's manager took one look at me and said, you're, you're, you're too memorable. You need to cut your hair. You need to shave your beard off. And I'm like, ugh. So I had short hair for years, hated it, and it was just like, but uh, it was it was a crazy experience. I mean, the most amazing thing is we played the Viña del Mar Festival in Chile right. in front of 60,000 people. And, and this is like your was, first major tour. Yeah, 22 years old. Good for you, Off man. Off the gate. And it was amazing. It was incredible. Um, that led to playing with um, a singer named Soraya who was incredible. She unfortunately passed away. Um, I played for Paulina Rubio. I played on a, a really cool record called uh, Grand City Pop. And while I was in Miami, I played on three number one singles. It was yeah. a really, really cool thing. Paulina Rubio. Um, uh, 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 there's a song by Tego Calderon called Chillin'. Uh, and there's a Christian Castro and Asa Falta, which blows my mind. However, they were number one Latin hits. So, um, you know, that was one of the frustrations that led me to come to L.A. because I wasn't playing on anything I would ever buy. As a, I'm a rock guy. I'm an English yeah. rock guy. And that's just not the stuff that I would listen to in my spare time. But I was very proud of those records. Um, the the Tango Calderon one was funny because I had just gotten my, uh, my, my Tweed Super. Uh, not super. It was a tweed. It was a tweed. I think it was a tweed super, and uh, I, I brought it into the studio. It was Inner Circle Studio because there's not a lot of bands based out of Miami, and Inner Circle was the people that did Bad Boys for uh, for uh, the cop show. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I was showing up with all this cool gear, and I did so many cool things. But with rap songs, they just grab a couple things and loop it. And the only thing they kept was my skank rhythm. And uh, my uh, boss, uh, DM3, I do this thing where I, uh, I, I do weird noises and stuff, radio head things, and they kept this delay thing. And that's cool. But uh, in Miami, I was kind of known as the weird guy because there was a lot of great guitar players in Miami. Uh, unfortunately, he recently passed on, but Dan Warner was one of the greatest guitar players who ever lived. But his whole joke was, yeah, it's all garbage. You know, I've played on, you know, thousands of albums, but it's like, it's nothing he would, he would have done. And I didn't want to end up like that because yeah. you know, he always dreamed of coming to LA and, you know, his, his, his heroes were guys like Tim Pierce and, and Michael Thompson and, uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah, all those guys. And, but he, in Miami, he played on all the Gloria Stefan stuff, uh, some of the Shakira stuff um even played on uh on some of the ricky martin stuff but it was just like so he would be the kind of like the go-to normal guy um while he was like the tim pierce of miami i was kind of like the john bryan uh jason faulkner um kind of like the weirdo guy they would bring in that that had all the weird sounds and had all the dilapidated old guitars and would bring a theremin or you know bring bring some some weird stuff uh, also, a multi instrumentalist. I I've been playing drums my entire life. I in Miami, my most popular band I was in was called DC Three, and I was the bass player. And we were one of the most popular local rock bands. And a lot of people knew me as a bass player. So, um, I, at one time, I did a session at Criteria Studios, and I brought a drum kit, I brought <laughs> my guitar rig, I brought three basses, and I brought keyboards. And I was a one man band for a session. And they were like, this is the most gear I've ever seen anybody load into this place. And it's a very famous place. I mean, that's where Layla was recorded and all the Aretha At Criteria, Frank. yeah, yeah. Criteria, you know, I Massive. feel good. Some of my favorite Chicago records were done there. And I brought in a whole band's worth of gear. And uh, they couldn't get the organ going. And I was just like, oh, you guys don't know how to turn on a Hammond organ? Come on, hold us for 30 minutes, for 30 seconds, and then let this go. And 
They're like, you're crazy, man. I'm like, yeah, this is the stuff I love. You know, I love vintage gear. Um, I also love, um, uh, I love oddball stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I've never been, I've never wanted a burst. I've never wanted a uh, 50 strat. I've never wanted, you know, some type of like modern uh, Tom Anderson crazy thing. I've always been like, you know, Fender Mustangs, uh, beat up tellies. Lately, I've been obsessed. I, I want a Travis Bean so bad. I've got a Kramer aluminum neck, but Travis Bean is, is something I have to have one day. <laughs> but I love that type of stuff. I, um, my favorite guitar amps are, are Music Man amps that aren't made anymore. They're half two. Right. And I love them. They're fantastic. And, uh, you know, I, I, that's the type of, I, uh, at one point, I was like, um, I made a joke. I'm like, I'm endorsed by guitar companies, the guitar amp companies that don't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, right. Music Man, Lab Series, Tusk, uh, uh, freaking, uh, uh, um, what was the Sun one? Shoot. Uh, Sundown amps which were really cool. And I just love that stuff, you know, like these old 70s companies. A lot of that stuff I had in Miami, I, I, I sold a lot of stuff before I moved here, but I've sure. accumulated way more since I moved to L.A. because L.A. is the most amazing place to go, go shopping in for guitar stuff. For I gear. live way too close to Norman's for guitars, but there's also a bunch of shops that I love that are more junk style, like uh, Future Music, which is great because that's where you'll find all the weirdo stuff, you know. But, um, but yeah, it's great. So that's what got me started in the professional world. And then I started producing a lot. And uh, God, I mean, he, almost immediately I was producing stuff that was getting heard. I uh, produced a record by a guy named Ed Hill called uh, A Ballad on Third Avenue that uh, one of the songs ended up in the top 20 of the, of the uh, um, adult contemporary. Um, How did you get my- these gigs? Like, why did people approach you for production? What, what or did you produce they knew something I a, they, knew I, they knew i had a really cool studio they knew i was affordable okay. and um one of the things that made me different than every other producer in miami is i didn't do any midi i didn't do any programming if there was a drum part it's drums or something that's real right real keyboards real guitar amps i wasn't using a pod you know so i was one of the more i was one of the few 100 percent organic guys yeah yeah la studios are very different than miami studios you go to a studio in la and there's always a ton of gear and a console you go to a studio in miami and there's a lot of studios where it's like a vocal mic a keyboard controller a computer and that's it you know i do guitar it's always straight in um there's a lot of programming going on um the old joke uh when i talk to my friends at criteria it's like yeah, we've got one of the best needs in the world and they're only using three channels, you know, <laughs> two channels for, for the computer and, and one channel for the vocal because they do a lot of rap because yeah, yeah, yeah. the reason that a criteria has actually survived is that's one of the few studios you could bring your entire entourage into a studio to the, oh, to the session, yeah. you know, but they have a great drum sound that isn't being used, you know, it's a, it's a bummer. And my God, with this COVID thing, studios aren't essential. so. Abbey Road is is silent for the first time in since it's been built. You yeah. know they've had to cancel all their sessions because they're a commercial studio. Home studios are the only ones that their things are going on, and it's mostly one man operations. So I hope that some studios can get that funding to be able to continue. Because my God, I mean, if a place like Abbey Road or Criteria closes because of this, it's a tragedy. Oh, it would be yeah. Hey, yeah. let me let me ask you this. Um, that's a great story, first of all, man. That was really cool. Thank you. Uh, two questions from that. The first question is, you were pretty confident to pick up the phone and do that. How did you, what gave you that confidence in your plan? Years and years and years of doing it for myself. And also, desperation. Um I was in college and I was not happy and I really wanted to do, I, I, okay. So I've been, even before I was a guitar player, I was a record collector and I was always obsessed with credits. Where, hang on and, a sec. Where were you going to school? University of Miami? No, I was going to school at Miami, Miami Dade Community College. At Miami Dade CC. Okay. okay. And, yeah. And it, and it was, it was, they only had a jazz program and uh, 
I, I found out the first day that what I think is jazz is not what jazz is to them. Right, right. They're like, what are your favorite jazz records? I'm like, John Lynn Ponty's Enigmatic Ocean, mm. Bob Vision Orchestra's Visions of the Emerald Beyond, the first Spyro Gyro record, Michelle Legrand, uh, uh, Michelle Legrand, Umbrellas of Schaberg, and John Coltrane's My Favorite Things. And the guy just went down the line. He's like, Mavish Orchestra, bad jazz, bad rock. <laughs> yeah. uh, John Ponty, violin is not a jazz instrument. Um, Michelle Legrand, <laughs> he's like, he's a film composer. You know, and Spinal, you know, Spyro Gyra, I should slap you. And then the best one was John Coltrane. No, Charlie Parker. Oh Sorry. Oh, God. And, and immediately... One of the things that's kept me working. That's so it, weird because music, people are open-minded usually. Like no, is, no, no, no. This was the most closed-minded guy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, no, you know, I'm not even going to go there with it. Yeah, but, yeah. But one of the things that's kept me working is I'm not a shredder. I could play fast, but I'm not like one of those guys that spent years learning all the modes and mm -hmm. dexterity. Um, I was always influenced by guys that were melodic. Mm. Um, or just plain simple and immediately the first thing they put it put in front of me was donna lee and i'm like this is the most notes i've ever had to learn and it just wasn't coming to me and he was just like saying man you know maybe this isn't maybe guitar isn't cut out for you he actually said that to me and i was wow. just like i can't do this the guitar is not about playing melodies that you can't just whistle along to, you know, without, and, and there's nothing against bebop, but it was something that it just not, it was not doing anything for me. And uh, my dad passed away from a heart attack and I was just like, mom, Sorry. That had to be prove tough. to you. It was a 2000, I was, I was, uh, I was 20, I was 20. And I was like, mom, I want to prove to you that I could do music for a living let me take a break from school and never how did went she back. react once was she oh, she knew, she knew, happy? She knew that, once? That, that i was in a, a rough spot and uh she wanted me to be happy oh that's and great she believed, she believed in me that's nice okay and, and i was i was actually surprised how immediate it was i, I was lucky uh because mm. people took a chance on this kid and um eventually i was making a really good living uh on tour with Christian Castro, um, I was, you know, it was a major tour. It was really, really major. And I was getting paid very well. I was getting paid very well to do sessions. I played on a bunch of great records. One of the craziest things is I ended up playing with the pop star Mika because he was being developed in Miami by uh, Jody Marr and John Merchant and Dan Warner. And they hired me to be the live guitar player. And I played his first two showcases. I mean, I was there when he brought in my house, my mom's house had a large studio that we used to have rehearsals in and uh, we rehearsed in there. I remember him saying, I just wrote this song and he started playing it on the piano and it was everybody's in love today in love today in love today. And I remember Johnny Marr saying, Oh, that's cute. Might be a good album cut. Well, it ended up becoming a number one hit all over the world. Sold millions and millions and millions of records i didn't play on it but i played it the first time it was ever performed live that's so, so wild that was a crazy thing you know and, I, and I, i'll never forget that um so many incredible experiences that i had in miami but nothing compared to what i've experienced out here in la um i wonder how different my life would be if i would have said mom i'm gonna go to la instead of you know whatever because there's two routes people take when they come to LA. They either come to LA to become a star or they come to LA and infiltrate exactly the circles that they want to be in. And there was no sacrifice. I knew exactly what circle I wanted to be in. And I wanted to come into the singer songwriter um, session world. And I wanted to make friends and work with the people that I wanted to make the, that I wanted to work with. And so far it's happened. I remember joking with someone in Miami saying, I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to work with John Bryan and Jason Faulkner and, uh, you know, Dave way and, and all these people. And, and I've worked with all of them. It's been an incredible experience. Uh, How did that happen? Uh, well, 
Um, there's a little bar. There's a little bar that's connected to a famous Jewish restaurant out here called Cantor's. And it's called the Kibitz Room. And my friend David Goodstein from Miami, who's an incredible drummer, kept on saying, you got to come out here. you got to come out here. You're going to kill it out here. Finally came out here in 2012. Immediately started going to their Tuesday night jams. And I get reminded by, by, uh, by Facebook, three months in, I was already subbing for their main guitar players. I was already being the guy. And that's huge. Oh, I didn't realize you've been out. You've been out there since 2012. Yes. I, I didn't know that for some reason. I thought it was recent. 2012. And uh, about to have my eighth anniversary in June. And uh, it's been incredible. I mean, one of the cool things about L.A. is that uh, people really help each other. And uh, if you are known for doing good work, you will climb that ladder pretty fast. Yeah. And again, I didn't come out here wanting to be a star. In fact, when I came out here, I said, I'm not going to have a band. I'm not going to be in a band. But I've ended up joining a bunch of bands, and I've enjoyed that. But I really wanted – I came out here with two main goals, becoming a producer professionally and becoming a first-call session guitar player. And the production work has been incredible, and the session work has been great. Um, and I've gotten to play on some ridiculous records, and there's there's so much stuff that are it's a, so many things that are about to happen. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I want to ask you about your work ethic because I'm really impressed by that. You know, you're super driven, and you um, you're really prolific, and you're also not shy about doing different styles of music in different genres, both in your production work and in your own solo work. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, what, what makes, where'd you get that work ethic from? Why do you do it? What make, you know, like, what makes you so hungry? What do you get out of that emotionally? I like a challenge. I like a challenge. And I also like the process of making the music. Um, I actually prefer recording than being on stage, even though I'm super natural on stage, but there's less variables. There's less things that could go wrong. And I love taking my time and making things sound great. I love yeah. mixing other people's work. I love playing on other people's productions. Um, I love a challenge too. Um, I uh, recently uh, was asked by a friend named Chloe DeLandis to, remake the music for the old Maybelline ads in the nineties. And I was like, all right, I give remember me those hour. ads, man. That's funny. I, I grabbed an old keyboard and just put together the cheesiest thing possible, but I really wanted it to sound authentic. And it's like, wow, thank you for doing this. I'm like, thanks for the challenge. You know, <laughs> enjoy that. You know, um, I also enjoy producers that say, just do your own thing. Just do your own thing. Just be yourself. I actually prefer that more than people that are like, Oh, we want we want an Eric Johnson thing. We want we want it to sound like Coldplay. We want we want you know. Can you do this? I like people to say just do your thing because they enjoy you, my voice. Are my, you like that as a producer? Okay, as a producer, I have one rule: no 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 programming. So that automatically makes it super easy for me to be in my comfort zone. Yeah. Um, and then I it's all based on the song. I'm a songwriter, I'm a singer songwriter. And when someone brings in a song, I always say, play it for me on your guitar or play it for me on your piano. And my ears start thinking, it's my ears that are thinking and I'm going, okay, this could use this beat. This could use this, this could use that, this could use this. Okay, that's the vibe I'm gonna go for. Um, I always joke that I'm like, I'm like a hairstylist. Tell me what you want and I'll tell you what will look good on you. Yeah. And I'm not going to let you get out of the studio until it sounds great. Right. And right. Um, another thing that I think is a trademark of mine is uh, I work really fast. Um, my studio is set up ergonomically so that I can jump between drums, bass, guitar, keys pretty fast. And I also um, have templates that I open up on Pro Tools where my drum sound is there. I have my three guitar tracks. Usually two rhythms, uh, doubled, stereo right, left, lead guitar. And then I have two acoustic tracks for doubles. And then I have, you know, 
all my sounds are there, all my compression settings, all my reverb settings. Uh, tambourine track is perfectly cued for my tambourines. Everything's ready to go because I have clients. Okay, I have one client for sure that his name is Ken Sharp, and he's an early bird. He usually wakes up at five o'clock every morning, goes to the gym, and then he says, "All right," he comes in at nine in the morning with a new song, and he leaves with the final mix at one. Okay, so he so you no you, breaks. You, you're really structured as far as like for um, you've created a bunch of systems to yes. maximize your efficiency. Yeah, yes. that's great, man. I've got that's really good. Uh, when I when I do sessions um, like Dave Way, I always bring two six string electric guitars, a twelve string electric sitar. Six string acoustic, Nashville acoustic. Um, Dave's got a great selection of guitars. He's got a great 12 string acoustic, so I don't have to bring that. Um, he's got some meat and potato stuff, but I always bring my stunt guitar, which is my Mustang. Uh, my stunt which, guitar. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard guitar, that term. It's the guitar. Well, you know what it is? My, it's literally my, my, I consider that my, my, my right hand. That, that guitar. I could do everything I want on that because it's got a great vibrato bar. It's not noisy. Um, it's got a great sound behind the nut, behind the bridge and behind the nut. Um, I could do swells, um, and uh, I can do all the stuff that makes me me. Right. And then I'll something like an SG or a Les Paul um, just to get because a lot of people love that crunch, you know. So that's the crunch sound. Um, and then I do a lot of electric sitar. I love my Rogue electric sitar. Um, and then I do a lot of 12 string stuff. I have a beautiful Rickenbacker 360 with the pyramid flat wound strings and it sounds great. I also have a Den Electro 12 string that I love and a Nashville tuned acoustic. That's right. a big, that's, that's a must. I mean, it's on everything I do. Basically. That's like an, uh, the first three strings that they're an octave higher or lower or something like that. It's the high strings off a of 12 string. Okay. So you have an E string and B string that are regular. Then the G string is an E string tuned up to uh, to G. Okay. The D string is a B string tuned up to D. The A string is a G string tuned up to A, and then the E string is a is a D string tuned up to E. So the bottom four strings are up an octave. The top two are regular. Gotcha. Beautiful chime. Yeah. And when you put that on a track, um, especially with a, with a two six strings in stereo. And then the the uh, uh, and then the, the the Nashville up in the middle, it's heaven. It's like the That's world's nice. biggest twelve string. It's like a stereo twelve string. Yeah. And I love that. Um, and I've always been a big twelve string fan. Uh, so I do a lot of that stuff. And then electric sitar has been one of my calling cards. Um, yeah, I don't hear that mentioned. Like I've heard that less than five times in seven hundred interviews. It's a great trick. I mean, it's uh, it's a, definitely a Tedesco trick where it's like it's tuned like a guitar, but it sounds like a like a sitar. But it, man, so many great tracks have had that, especially double, like the solo and uh, running from the dead, running running to, from the devil by by uh, Van Halen. It's uh, no no. Ain't talking about love. Ain't talking about love. The solo is a uh, twelve string. It's a it's a uh, uh, sitar guitar and an electric guitar, both distorted. Do it again by by Steely Dan. Um, uh, Science Seal Delivered by Stevie Wonder. Um, so many cool, it's uh, close to the edge by Yes, yeah. but it's a really cool, really cool sound. And I've played it on the Echo in the Canyon thing, I've played it in a bunch of Louis Goffin records, and it's great. It's really cool. Um, I, I listened to your you mentioned acoustic, I listened to your solo record, The Crimson Guitar. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you for releasing an all acoustic record like that because i think you could think of a million reasons why you shouldn't do that because it's just you and a guitar it's a pretty vulnerable it's not even it's not even an acoustic record it's a solo acoustic record everything on that track on that album are one take classical guitar one microphone um i uh, i'm endorsed by uh by, by godane and i they i have this really beautiful lapatri mario classical. and yeah yeah, and, man, he's uh, a buddy. He's a good buddy of mine. He's, he's a, a great he's guy. A great guy. Yeah. And uh, La Petri has this beautiful sound, and I had just gotten mm -hmm. it. And I, I said, oh, let's see how this thing records. And I started playing Piece of Theme by King Crimson. And I was just like, 
oh, let's see what else I could do. And I had all these other arrangements of King Crimson songs. And it ended up getting released in, by Cherry Red on this uh, label that's, uh, that's by Yes's Management that I released my progressive rock stuff on. And the thing that blew my mind is actual members of King Crimson sharing it. Wow. Kind of Trey Gunn, Jeremy Stacy. I mean, that's huge. And then Robert Fripp's uh, social media. I don't know if Robert Fripp does his own social media, sure. but he shared it twice. And my entire life, I was always like, in a, I'm not worthy type of situation because that music is so technical. Yeah, it is. And a lot of King Crimson's fans are very snobby about technique. And the first thing I did with my Crimson guitar album is this album is not going to be the math prog stuff. This is going to be the beautiful King Crimson stuff. So I'm doing stuff like I Talk to the Wind, Moon That's Child, um, and uh, Starless, and uh, a Book of Saturday. And it's very simple arrangements, but I wanted the melodies. I wanted it to be melody over ego. I wanted it to be uh, an easy listening King Crimson record. It's a really and pretty a record, people, man. A lot of people have told me that they love listening to the record in the morning or while studying or while making breakfast or whatever. And it definitely has a purpose. So I'm going to be doing a second one uh, this year. Good for you. Uh, I'm working on uh, I'm going to take it even further because this one focused on the original period of King Crimson. But I'm definitely going to attack some of the Baloo era, some of the new stuff, some of the um, other things that I've done in the last 50 years. So, yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, it was a really nice. I give you credit for doing that. I had I had classical guitar is a big backbone for me. Classical guitar is a big backbone. It changed my life. Um, you know, I did classical guitar in high school and rock ensemble, but classical guitar, uh, it taught me a vocabulary that I use on electric guitar a lot. Mm. A lot of the arpeggios I learned, the finger technique, the the thumb index ring, uh, you know, this type of thing. Sure. Uh, um, it definitely made me a better acoustic guitar player and a better electric guitar player. And I also learned a lot of really cool chords that I use to this day. Um, a lot of open string stuff, a lot of uh, little technique things. And so, you know, many ways that was a love letter to my classical guitar instructor, Doug Burris. So that's cool. Go. It's funny. You mentioned Jeremy Stacy. I had his brother here on the show. Have you ever met his brother? Paul, Paul, <laughs> He's Paul, just... Paul, Paul I've worked with Paul. Um, He's a trip. <laughs> the record zebra crossing at abbey road i i'm a beatles nerd yeah and the date that they gave me july 27th i went in the beatles recording book to see what what day what what they did um and on, on every july 27th and i found out that the original version of uh while my guitar gently weeps was recorded on the 27th of july 1968 Oh, wow. 40 years, 50 years later, I'm in the same room and I decided to do a new version of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. And I called all my friends in London to come help me. And Paul Stacy played bass uh, and, and he was so cool. He helped me out with gear. Yeah, he's a... Uh, he's he, was a there, he was there all day. Yeah, he's got and a he ton was, of gear. Oh, well, yeah. He's, he's really knowledgeable. He's, he's, uh, he, he deserves it. There's yeah. a lot of people I know that have a ton of gear that don't. He deserves it. And and he's, he's got a, the world's yeah. most amazing gear and great guitar player. Great, yeah, great Tony gets. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Great dude. It's funny. Um, is there like you work in a lot of different genres? Is there a, are there any genres that you personally enjoy the most to listen to or to play in? Singer songwriter music. Straight up, I I, I love a good song. I love melodic music. I love a song where I could play the melody on guitar and enjoy it. You know, um, I also love power pop and I love prog rock. However, there's an asterisk next to it. I love prog rock, not prog metal. Like I'm not, there's something that happened right after rush where all of a sudden prog was all about the riff was all about math was all about playing synchronized riffs in 13, eight, I'm, I'm talking about real prog to me, which is King Crimson, Curved Dare, Jethro Tull, uh, Yes, Genesis, um, like Renaissance, um, Focus, stuff that has melody, you know, melody, and 
dynamics. It's not all in your face. It's not all pull out your calculator and figure out what the drummer's doing. It's all about texture too. Like Steve Hackett records, uh, Camel, um, so many great stuff that's just like beautiful, melodic music where all the instruments shine. And it's not, you know, there's a lot, of, I do the cruise to the edge every year. And there's a lot of bands that are really, 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 really technically good. But after the show, you can't whistle a single song. You can't <laughs> think of what, what, you know, it's overwhelming. Yeah. And more power to them. But my personal taste in Prague is melodic, tasteful, and textured Prague. Orchestral Prague, you know, mellotrons, flutes, uh, mandolins, lap steel. I love lap steel, by the way. Oh, that's another thing I bring to sessions, my, my, my magnetone lap steel, which I, I adore. But yeah, I love that stuff. Volume swells, um, electric sitars, double neck guitars, 12 strings, you know. Um, I love that. 7 8 is super fun to play in. You know, I love 7 8, I love 5 4, I love 6 8, I love uh, 11 8, you know. But I like the concept of like music that, that isn't always in the same dynamic takes you on a journey you know yeah i do know that's, that's, that's i love music. sonic candy too i my band one of my bands in miami was called dreaming in stereo and that's one of the things that i i definitely i, I put on headphones and i want to be taken on a journey you know panning mm -hmm. the art of panning these days it's like you know you'll, you don't hear any records anymore that have any ear candy because they're they wanted to sound good on an iphone right so you know no I love the sound of a double tracked acoustic. I love the sound of a double track guitar solo. I love when guitar solos fly through the speakers. You know, it's a cool thing. Very cool. I'm very it. 70s. That's my favorite decade. And uh, all my favorite producers. I'm wearing a Todd Rundgren Utopia shirt right I now. You know? that. Yeah, man. That's, that's, that's my Bible right there. You know, producers like Todd Rundgren, uh, freaking uh, Roy Thomas Baker. Um, Glenn Johns, uh, uh, Jeff Emmerich. Uh, I love that stuff. You know, it's, 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 it's really what I, what I consider the pinnacle of sound to me, you know? Um, t do t pick, pick a few, two or three artists that you've worked with that have interesting, like, how did you get the gig and like talk about a cool story about that artist? Just pick any two or three you'd like. Okay. Todd Rundgren. Um, first of all, I opened up for him twice. I'm really good friends with his, his, uh, his family, his, his son, his wife, his musicians. I'm part of the scene. And one day, how did you, how did you get to be part of that scene? Uh, I got to be part of that scene through Chasm Sultan, who's his bass player for, I, ha I had him on the show. He's a deep cat. Yeah. That guy should write a book. Yeah, he should. Uh, <laughs> he's got so many incredible stories. He's played on so many incredible records. Yeah. And he's one of the greatest bass players of all time, in my opinion. And his voice is insane. Oh, yeah. And uh, I met Chasm through a friend, through a mutual friend. I opened up for Chasm. He really liked me. And, you know, I opened up for Todd immediately. I was just like, hey, you know, Todd, there's this kid. He's really good. And I opened up for him in Miami. And I kept in touch with him. And I'm also really active on his social media. Okay. Well, he did a contest. So Todd used to be all about gear and analog and studio. And since he's slowed down these days where he's like living in Hawaii, one of the first things he wanted to do is not no longer have a real studio because he always had a studio at his home. And now he has like a little room and he does a lot of programming and doesn't have any amps and he's just very like in the box and he's been putting out these records that are very techno very um, dance oriented and he said i want to do a remix contest for my new song kaleidoscope and he's posted all the stems and said let's see your remixes well the fatal flaw of his contest is it was fan votes and uh a lot of todd's fans want him to rock well, what I did is I turned his dance song into a rock song. 
Oh, very stripped cool. Stripped away the drum machine, stripped away the synthesizers, kept his vocal, kept his guitar, and added real drums with any design. Uh, did all the bass, keyboards. I even played some electric guitar solo stuff. And that won. And the award that, was, it got released on a Todd Rundgren album. Oh, that's so, awesome. It's the best. And I remember when Todd announced it, he says, well, you guys voted and here's our winner in, 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 in quotes with his best remix in quotes, Fernando Perdomo. So he was, he was probably excited about a real dance remix. And in fact, on the album that got released, the single uh, for Global Nation, where my song was on it, there was another remix on there by a famous band called The F Buttons. And I was just like, oh, I see. He picked his favorite remix and the fans' favorite remix. Right. And his, his, his favorite remix was like extreme underground house EDM. Like the song was mangled. Mine, it's his song. It's a real song. And it's because like, that's the thing. Todd's songwriting has never changed. It's just very electronic now. And underneath all the production, underneath all the boom booms, there's real songs. So I decided to turn it into a rock song. And it came out great. And I'm very proud of it. And that was incredible. So, And this was years play- after you had opened for him. Oh, yeah. This wow, was that's really cool. And uh, that's still one of the biggest achievements of my life was to say that I worked with Todd Rundgren and that I technically produced the track. Um, That's awesome. And I'm on lead guitar and you know, it, it's a, it's a cool thing. Uh, recently I uh, played a reunion of Todd's first band, the Naz and yes. Todd was available and I was asked to be the lead guitar player. So I technically filled in for him with Stuki and Tom Mooney, the surviving other members of the Naz. And we played a show in Cincinnati. And we actually had another show in Philly on June 1st. It's now canceled because of COVID. But I'm looking forward to making new music with Tom and Stuki. And hopefully one day Todd will be available and we'll jam. That's so wild. Why Cincinnati? What? That's like a, was, was that where the band was from? That, like, what, no. You know? <laughs> that, it was a, it was a there's think this so. thing called Todd Rundgren, this thing called Rundgren Radio. And they do these Rundgren fests. Okay. And he was playing two nights in Cincinnati. Gotcha. So they said, let's, let's just... Let's uh, let's latch on to that and do uh, a night before the first show. Because gotcha. everyone's flying in anyway. Right. And amazing. And there's some video online, and that was a lot of fun. That's and, cool. Uh, you know, Todd is my favorite guitar player of all time. So I am not necessarily a Todd clone, but I've learned a lot of his vocabulary. And I play a Fender Mustang, uh, which is Todd's number one for years. And there's a certain thing that you can do with that guitar, with the vibrato bar, that you can't do on any other guitar because it's so slinky and it goes up and down. So in, in many ways, Todd's guitar style is based on kind of like Jan Hammer's Mini Moog thing where he does the like up and down stuff. It's very synthesizer type soloing. And I love doing that stuff, you know? It's the best. That's cool, man. Tell me another one. Another one that's uh, I still cannot believe. Um, I got to work on the Emmett Rhodes fourth album called Rainbow Ends. Emmett Rhodes is one of my favorite artists of all time. He was one of the first one-man bands in the studio. They used to call him the one-man Beatles. And Emmett uh, made a record, uh, his self-titled debut album, which was the first home-recorded album released on a major label on CBS in 1969. 70 and uh he made three incredible records and then disappeared and 44 years after his last record uh farewell to paradise my friend chris price assembled a dream band to back him up and make his first record in 44 years and i'm talking jason faulkner and roger manning of jellyfish uh, this guy, an amazing guitar player named Taylor Locke of the band Rooney. I was on bass, and uh, Joe Siders of uh, American Pornographers uh, uh, on 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 uh, on uh, on New Pornographers on on drums, and we also had John Bryan come in. We also had uh, uh, the Bangles come in. Um, uh, it was it was a, a dream, and I still couldn't believe that I was there. 
playing bass in front of one of my favorite bass players of all time and him saying it sounded great. And that record, there's a guy named Bob Lefsitz. Yeah. He has a very guy. popular uh, email list. Column, and yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, email list. He says right. that that's his favorite record of the last five years. The Emmett, what's it's it called? called? Emmett Rhodes? Rainbow Ends by Emmett Rhodes. And I forget about it. That's that's a crowning achievement for me. I can't believe that record exists. And because uh, Emmett... What happened to the guy? Like, is it R O R H O A D E S? Like, it... like the keyboard, Rhodes. Okay. How, how did... What happened to him? Like, why did he not make records for 45 years? He ended up becoming a staff producer for Elektra. Okay. And didn't do much. He had a... He built a beautiful studio in his home. And for years, it lied... It was storage for him. And one of the first things that we did was clean it up and actually get things working. We were able to get his old console working and a lot of his tape machines weren't working anymore. But he had his original pianos and he had some of his original stuff. He had sold all his guitars. He still had, he had a Squire Strat or something. and Didn't have his 335 anymore, his Hofner bass or whatever. But the cool thing about it is Chris Price assembled a band of Emmett Rhodes fans. Yeah. So it was hilarious. Like I remember Emmett Rhodes is a little bit of a eccentric and he's a little extra uh he's amazing he's a genius but he's very 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 uh in your face and i remember at one point he was arguing with joe siders because joe siders had muted had 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 uh tuned his drum set like the set, like the 60s like very early 70s very boxy very dead sound and he's like your tom town tom can you curse on the show Oh, you do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, okay. He's like, your, your, your drums sound like shit, man. And he grabs his tom-tom, one of his drums, and it's super, like, it doesn't have any, any padding or anything on it. It's this big, ringy, like, horrible-sounding thing. It's like, this is what a drum's supposed to sound like. And he's like, but Emmett, I'm trying to make my drums sound like your first record. He's like, oh, well, if you want that sound, you've got it. But <laughs> it's... 2015 you know or 16 you know drums sound like this and it's like emmett we're trying to make an emmett Rhodes record here yeah and it's like okay and i remember him, there's a video it's like where was this recorded la or, or in la okay and that was at his original studio in hawthorne and uh man it's a cool record oh my god one of the greatest guitar players on earth takes a solo on that record nels klein I had and Nels on my show, and he really is an amazing player, man. That guy is the bomb. And uh, He's a there's a uh, man, guy, man. There's a there's a solo he does on that record that I uh, tears, tears flowing every time. Um, and uh, the song is called uh, I Can't Tell My Heart. And uh my God, Nels Klein. I've worked with him a couple of times. He played on a Linda Perhax record I produced with. Uh, I work a lot with uh, Pat Sansone, who's also in Wilco. And he came in and played a solo on a Linda Perhax track. But the solo he plays on I Can't Tell My Heart is one of the best solos I've ever heard in my entire life. Mm -hmm. It's and it, it, it's him on a jazz master. And it's just yeah, like it's... there's certain things that he does. His influences are all over the place. He's a jazz bow. But he's also super influenced by like Tom Verlaine and uh, Lou Reed and like, you know, the, pro, the pro punk stuff. He also loves Prague. He loves Robert Fripp. But he does this pull off thing that he does. It's just like, oh, it's insane. But I've been in, in the presence of some incredible guitar players. He's a um, deep cat, man. He should probably write it. He's had a hell of a story, too, man. He should oh, he's incredible. Um, so the other one is Echo in the Canyon, which. Uh, yeah. So, uh, when I first moved to LA, I infiltrated the scene by, by playing a Tuesday night jam called uh, the Kibitz Room Jam. Yeah. Uh, the Friends of Candor's Kibitz Room, aka the Fockers, they do this thing every Tuesday. And basically, it's like free form jamming and a lot of um, mashups. So, one minute you're on stage and you're playing a Jackson 5 song, and then the singer, Morty, will start singing a Wings song and we have to suddenly morph into that song. 
and then he'll go into some random TV theme, and we'll go into that. And if you can hang, it's a lot of fun. But I've seen a lot of people crash and burn, like incredible musicians that have been literally kicked off stage because they can't hang. Yeah. Because it's, it's all about the ears. That's, there's gigs you play with your hands. There's gigs you play with your ears. And one of my biggest uh, assets is my ears. Uh, I don't really read music. Uh, charts just, you know, they just get in the way for me. So my ear training, I could learn chords. I could learn songs by on the spot. And I could also adapt to musical changes because I'm always listening. Um, one day, a guy in a suit came up to me and said, man, you're a great guitar player. I'm Andy. I'm like, oh, nice to meet you, Andy. He kept on coming back. And one night, uh, we jammed on a song called Mr. Soul by, by Buffalo Springfield. Yeah, of course. Great I took song. my most Neil Young solo I could possibly do. And Andy was like, all right, that's it, man. I'm producing a record. Can you be in the studio tomorrow? <laughs> Had no idea what I was getting into. I showed up with my gear and he says, oh, I should have told you. I didn't want you to bring anything. I, I am a guitar collector and I want you to use my stuff. I ended up only using one of my guitars on the Echo in the Canyon soundtrack, which is my sitar. So it turns out Andy is Andrew Slater, who was the president of Capitol Records for years. He also produced Fiona Apple's title album and uh, Macy Gray's album and a couple of the Wallflowers records. And uh, he also used to produce Warren Zevon. Uh, people were talking a lot about Splendid Isolation. He produced that. Mm. Okay. So... He says, this is a covers record, and uh, the singer you're about to hear is Jacob Dylan, and we're doing a bunch of songs from the Laurel Canyon era. And uh, he's like, do you know the song uh, Go Where You Want to Go by the Mamas and Papas? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, so you don't need a chart? I'm like, no. Immediately went into that. Played his Gretsch 6120-63. Took the most Neil Young solo I possibly could. He was in heaven. Next song, he's like, you showed me by the Turtles. I'm like, I love that song. Didn't need a chart. Questions by Buffalo Springfield. Mm. Didn't need a chart. You know, uh, the real test was something obscure. And he said, no matter what you do by love. I'm like, yeah, I know that one. Bam. And he kept on calling me back. And I kept on playing on all these cool 60s covers with Jacob Dylan. And he says, well, it's going to be a duets record. Jacob's singing the whole song right now. We're going to end up cutting half of his vocals and putting in other people. And I started getting text messages that everybody dreams of. Hey, you remember that song in my room you played on? That's Fiona Apple now. Hey, you remember that song, uh, uh, Bells of Rimney? Beck's singing on that one. Hey, um, here's where I started getting crazy. Congratulations, Fern. You're on a track with Eric Clapton. Oh, my God. And it just kept on getting better. Hey, Fernando. Uh, Neil Young tried to take a stab at the solo on Go Where You Want to Go. And we're keeping yours. You beat out <laughs> Neil Young. Like, no That's way. pretty cool, man. Um, so this was his album that was going to be an album. And we went to go do a show because he wanted to release the album. The album was already mixed and mastered by April 2015. And we went to go do a show at the Orpheum that was filmed because he wanted to have some promotional footage. That's when he got the bug to make a movie because he said, this would make a good movie. Oh. Movies take way longer than albums. Yeah. So the movie didn't come out until 2018. There's footage of us performing. That's 2015. But now you're on a license on a full movie soundtrack. Oh, yeah. That's and awesome. The movie though. is amazing. It's on Netflix. It's about to be released in Europe. So it's going to have a whole new life cycle. That's awesome, man. Um, we performed uh, opening night was at the Cinerama Dome uh, in, in LA. First band to ever play in the Cinerama Dome. And Stephen Stills and Roger McGuinn showed up. And we played oh. with Stephen Stills and Roger McGuinn. We've also performed with Michelle Phillips and the Mamas and the Papas. That's cool. We've performed with Jackson Brown, and uh, it, it's uh, unbelievable. 
that night Ringo was there, Ringo Starr, and I got to meet Ringo Starr. I got to meet a Beatle right before he saw me play. That one of the one of the things I always say is figure out legit ways to meet your idols. Not at NAM, not after a show. Meet them when you're actually working with them. Yeah. Meet them when you actually have something to say, you know? And that really is an incredible blessing for me that I've gotten to meet guys like Roger McGuinn, you know, after working with them. You know, I love I loved saying this line. Hey, we've only met musically. I'm on a record with you. I'm Fernando. You know, I love that. Meeting <laughs> I haven't met Clapton yet, but when I right. meet him, I'll be like, Hey, remember that rhythm guitar you played too? When you played that solo on questions. That's cool, man. You know, even though I gotta tell you, I did cut a solo on that. It was really cool. I did a backwards guitar solo on an old Les Paul jr. And, uh, he's got that track somewhere, but of course he used Clapton, but still my solo was pretty cool. So you but, beat out Neil Young, maybe second place to Clapton. Uh, yeah. It's still yeah. not bad, man. <laughs> Just to mention that your name it's is mentioned in that same. Blower. Yeah, it's of course. Blower. And then when to look at the credits on the album, because um, he did 70s style credits. So okay. everybody's listed. That's and great. The credit on questions says guitars Jeff Perlman, Fernando Perdomo, Eric Clapton, Stephen Stills. In that order. That's awesome. And I'm like, okay, I'm never going to be able to top that. That's huge and there's tracks where neil young just sang and i played guitar that's okay when i started playing guitar my idols were the beatles you know wings neil young eric clapton and one of my secret sauce bands peter svensson of the of the of the cardigans huge influence of mine when i was in high school i was a huge fan of Peter Svensson of the Cardigans and Steve Caton, who was the guitar player for Tori Amos. Those were my, uh, my modern influences at the time. I was also really into like a lot of the grunge guys. So there's that ethic because yeah. I'm 39. So when I was in middle school, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, that was happening. Um, so I got really into that stuff. But then I really became the biggest nerd when it came to the Cardigans because I was a fan of theirs before Love Fool. And some of the most interesting guitar playing you will ever hear are on the Cardigans records. I'm going to go check Peter that Peter Svensson out. Wrote that down here. Was, had an incredible vocabulary, chordal vocabulary, and he was also a master of the cool sounds. Um, a lot of the rhythm guitars are like, he has a Hofner. I have the same thing, a Hofner committee. Um, like a, a electric and the pickups suck on those but he mic'd it like you know it's a mic'd electric acoustic and it's like a really cool sound and a flat one flat one strings on guitars which i right. love um a lot of dead sounds a lot of uh, uh punchy and bizarre sounds and a lot of fuzz and i love that stuff so yeah i'm an architect when it comes to guitar sounds i love coming up with interesting off the wall sounds but I'm also really good at meat and potatoes. Like, I mean, I could get all the like classic rock tones, but I love the, what the hell is that aspect of some sounds lately? I've been really obsessed with the, uh, electro harmonics, Mellotron pedal. Right. That thing is, Oh man, I've got all the tricks down. It's, it's a lot of fun. Also the Keeley synth one, which is, uh, where I get all my Todd Runger and utopia sounds. Uh, <laughs> When Todd Runger and Utopia first came out, they had a guy named M. Frog Labatt, and he had a rack of EMS VCS3 synthesizers, and everyone thought he was like the lead synthesizer player, but they noticed that he was always just twirling knobs. All he was was processing Todd Rundgren's guitar through synthesizers, turning on octavers, to, you know, running filter, and I could get all those sounds using the Synth 1 pedal, which is really, really cool. And uh, I love that stuff. You know, I'm not a big fan of the modern guitar synthesizer, but I love the glitchy, like 70s guitar synthesizer sounds. One of the things I always want, I actually have a guitar that has an audit, has a, has a, uh, an ARP, um, uh, what's, what's, avatar pickup. Okay. I want an ARP avatar. I want that sound. I want, I want the, 
the weird glitchy latency synthesizers. I love that stuff. I have one of those old Casio uh, digital guitars with the plastic strings. Love that. I've used it on a couple of Jacob Jeffries records and it, the mandolin sound is the best. It's so ridiculous. You run it through all the sorts of effects and it sounds great. Right on, man. So it's good. So you're, you, it's, you, your niche is exactly what you said. It's an older sounding, more, uh, I don't want to say the word authentic, but more live sounding stuff. That's, you know, uh, it's cool. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. What were some of maybe the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Oh my God. Nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing is worse than like the close calls. Um, I was in a band called Price that got picked up by Geffen Records. And uh, right around that time, my mom got sick. And uh, there was some infighting in the band. There was, some, uh, there was an internal contract that uh, basically said that if the band gets signed, which did get signed, actually the internal contract happened after they got signed to Geffen. And the contract said I couldn't do any session work. Um, they my me God. To just, that that I that I would have to focus on the band. only that only that so no solo albums no session work and around the time my mom got sick and the rest of the band moved to LA and I stayed in Miami and I was very depressed because mm. we had auditioned for Geffen at Oceanway Studios and um, there was only three people sitting down on a couch and they all looked familiar one of them was Ron Fair. One of them was Tom Panunzio, and the other one was a guy named Jack. And I'm like, are you Jack Joseph Puig? He's like, yep. I'm like, gave him a big hug, and I said, this is for spilt milk, jellyfish. <laughs> and um, I had the Mustang, and he's like, how do you get this sound? I'm like, well, two of my favorite guitar players use Mustangs, Todd Rundgren and Jason Faulkner. And immediately, we started geeking out about Todd Rundgren. So... My favorite album of all time is an album called War Babies by Hall & Oates, which is produced by Todd Rundgren. And Todd plays all the guitar on it, most of the guitar on it. And it's a, a... Everything I love about music is on that record. It's psychedelic. War Babies. It's prog. What, what, huh? what year is that from? 75. 74, 75. So basically, Hall & Oates had, had released Abandoned Luncheonette in 73. And they went on tour opening up for Ziggy Stardust era, David Bowie. Okay. And all of a sudden, Daryl Hall said, I want to shave my eyebrows off, take LSD, and become David Bowie. We need to find some producer, and we need to make Ziggy Stardust. Well, guess what David Bowie did? He stopped being Ziggy and said, we got to do Philly Soul. So he went to go do Young Americans. Right. And uh, Hall & Oates went to do War Babies, which tanked. And they lost their deal with Atlantic. And their, their manager, Tony, Tommy Matola, said, okay, you guys have one more shot. We signed with RCA. It's a one-album deal. You've got to go back to the R&B. And they did Sarah Smile, and the rest is history. The rest is history, yeah, okay. But the That's... album right before Sarah Smile is, a, is, okay, I always say. You said it tanked, though. But what do you... It tanked. It tanked. Nobody bought it. Yeah. It was, it was the, no singles. No singles. But? Um, so, Sgt. Pepper is the sound of LSD in 1967. War Babies is the sound of people taking LSD for the first time in 1974. <laughs> so, there's synthesizers involved. There's disco, slightly funky, you know, drums involved. And the thing about Hall & Oates and Todd Rundgren is they're both from Philadelphia. So they grew up on soul music. Right. So there's a lot of soul going on. But the topics of that album include, um, uh, there's, a song about a, uh, there's a song about a night watchman who has a, a bank of TV screens and he's watching uh, people on, on, in, uh, in Times Square and he falls in love with a prostitute that he sees every night. And the song's called I'm Watching You. And it's oh my God, that's on, wild. It's basically a psychedelic song about, about uh, surveillance and masturbation. And it's a really, really cool song. And it gets very dark, very dark. Was, and was Caleb song, Quay the guitar player on that? Caleb uh, started playing with them in 77 after my friend Eddie Zine. Um, so I have a big, I'm also very connected with the Hall & Oates world because 
Uh, they're banned in the 70s, uh, from 74 to 77. I uh, had a, 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 two guys from Miami, uh, St Stephen Dees and Eddie Zion were the bass player and drummer. And Eddie ended up moving back to Miami and becoming my drummer when he was in his 60s. Wow. So Small I world, know, man. Holy shit. And, and uh, they, they switched their band in 78 and brought in the Elton John band. So it was Roger Pope, Caleb Quay, Kenny Passarelli, right. and uh, they that that was the along the Red Ledge Lifetime band, but the band right before was even better, and that was the band that did. Uh, they unfortunately had a producer that only used the big cats in the studio, yeah. So they didn't get to play on any records, but they did uh, end up on, on the uh, box set. Okay. So back to War Babies. It's what makes it my favorite record is that it's not a record everyone's going to love. And in fact, it was panned by critics. So that's what makes it, I love the underdog yeah. factor of it. But I listen to that record once a month and it takes me to a place. And I love every note of it. There's even some stuff that's a little questionable, some tuning stuff. And there's some stuff that's a little off the wall. Um, there's a song, there's a song called Screaming Through December uh, where Daryl Hall makes his voice sound really, really low. And he's like, Quasar, Quasar, bleeding on a synthesizer. Blah, 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 blah. It's, like, it's like, really. It's, it's was he actually deep, tripping on drugs when he made that? They were. Oh, they yeah. Were. Okay. They, they were like all on LSD. And, uh, That's like a mid, what is that, like a midlife crisis response? Uh, a rock and roll star? Daryl Hall shaved his eyebrows off. He looks like a space yeah, alien. That's so funny. And that was like really, really cool. Um, you know, uh, uh, that was a great line. Faustus ate glass for Faustus ate glass for an appetizer and bled all over a synthesizer. You know, there's even song, there's even references to female pattern baldness in the same song. It's just like you know, <laughs> Sammy lost a hair. Wait, no, no, that, no, no, Sammy is going bald, but uh, because she was ironing her hair way too much back in '64. <laughs> wow, it's just so cool. It's really, it's an incredible record. There's a whole song about watching TV, about being obsessed with TV. And then there's War Babies, which is all about being born in 45. You know, yeah. it's like, and it basically references everything he was raised on. Serial, TV commercials, Zorro, everything. And it's like, it's such a trippy album. And then I just read that, that John Oates almost quit during the making of that album because it was so Daryl heavy. And because that's the album where Daryl really took control. And he's a great keyboard player. And the songs are very, very interesting. And uh, it's really cool. So back to the horror story. Yeah. So you got, your band got I, picked I, up and then your mom got sick. Pooh's and I find out that Jack Joseph Pooh's favorite record is War Babies. So we're geeking out about War Babies. And the band's manager says, can, Fernando, can we have a minute? He takes me outside and he says, Stop talking to Jack. You've mentioned three artists that are not the band's influences. Shut up about Todd Rundgren. Shut up about Hall and Oates. Stop. And don't mention Jellyfish. And I'm like, immediately, that's the moment where I said, I don't think I'm going to last in this band. And I ended up staying in Miami, take care of my mom, and I watched in horror as the band did nothing. Wow. They were signed. Well, they, see, this was 2007, and this was after Napster destroyed music. Right. The music business was operating while on fire. So they were signing bands still, but they realized that they didn't have the money to properly promote them, so they would shelve them. And Price made an album with Jack Joseph that got shelved. They made an album with Abraham Laboriel that got shelved. Oh, wow. They made an album with Tony Berg that was set for release and they made a music video and at the last minute got shelved. So my Turn friends that were- interest that you didn't- huh? So it worked yeah. out for you that you didn't- yeah. in, the t in, the, in the six years that they were signed to Geffen, they released one song. Oh my God. In those six years, I released four of my own albums, five albums with another band, and I produced maybe 60 records. 
Wow. So, so it really wasn't a low point. I mean, it was, it was disappointing no, initially, point, but it worked out. Was, did I just give away my, my big break? Oh, okay. I just didn't know my big break wasn't going to happen for another 10 years. Gotcha. But gotcha. that's the thing. Adapting. I don't mind if I don't ever become famous or if I'm never on the cover of Guitar Player Magazine or if I'm never a rock star. It's all about happiness. It's all about the brain. There's two, there's two bank accounts. There's the one in your wallet and there's the one in your heart. And I'm constantly feeding the one in my heart while still making enough money to, to, to support. The, yeah, 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 of course. Support yeah. my family, support my yeah. house. And, uh, but I've done enough to be happy and not give up. Sure. Um, and, you know, the guys in Price I'm still friends with. They're like three brothers. And they're extremely talented. But the difference also was, was I was like four years older. So I realized that if I would have done that deal, I would have gotten out of that deal at uh, 30, 31. They got, out, they got out of that deal at 26. Yeah. So they still had, they didn't lose their entire career. But man, I would have been in a completely different place. But you never know. I might have moved to LA, quit the band, and become a session guitar player way earlier. No, you can't think like that, man. That's like, you just, nah, it, I don't it, care. it doesn't serve you looking in that rear view mirror because you and never I know. You could have been dead too. Well, Chris Price ended up producing the Emmett Rhodes record, and we ended okay. up producing one of the Parax records together. So our friendship wasn't killed. Right. But it was definitely a tough decision. Yeah. Um, another low point was um, I was working with an artist named Hillary McRae. And again, my low points are not necessarily low points. They're more like temporary high points that ended up becoming low points. And Hillary got signed to Starbucks' label called Hear Music. And I was her bass player. I co-wrote one of the songs. I did a lot of uh, arranging and I was kind of her musical director. She was an artist that was basically the best way to describe her. It was the female Michael McDonald or okay. Laura Nero, Carol King fronting Chicago. So Charlie Colello, who did a lot of the Laurel Nero arrangements, did all the horn arrangements. I was playing very Peter Sotera type bass. I did a lot of guitar on the record and it was very, very 70s. And she got signed in 2007. Their order of releases were Paul McCartney, James Taylor live album, Joni Mitchell, Hillary McRae. Uh, and Hillary was going to be the first new artist on the label. And we were like, this is going to be amazing. This is going to be huge. I got her the gig opening up for Todd Rundgren on her release date. The first sign that things were not going to be good. We said, can we get some CDs to sell? They're like, no, we want people to go to Starbucks to buy the CDs. Mm -hmm. So she had no merch wow. on her table. Well, by the time the Joni Mitchell album came out, Charles Schultz, the head or whatever, the head of, uh, of Starbucks said, why are we making records? We're a coffee company. So by the time Hillary's record came out, they dropped their promotion budget. Oh my God. Video. Uh, Carly Simon was next. Her album didn't even come out. She sued them. So Hillary McRae was also very young. She was only 20. And they put her on the road opening up for a guy named Teddy Geiger, whose audience was all 13 year old girls. Nice. We're playing jazz. We're playing like blood, sweat, and tears style jazz, which flew over their heads. And the tour was a disaster. And I ended up quitting the tour because there was some terrible things happening in the, on, on the bottom. And Hillary hasn't made a record since. Oh, wow. It was We played the Today Show. Um, and that was it, you know. Her single, I still hear her song. Uh, Every day is the same. Um, sometimes at CVS or, you know, at, at like supermarkets. But that's it. Turns out that she owed the record label and her management so much that she couldn't record albums or release them until they paid, paid her back. Oh, wow. That's it terrible. sucks because. Through no, excuse me, through no fault of her own. No fault of her own. Yeah, She's so talented. That's but terrible. I haven't talked to her in years, and 
I really hope that she one day comes out of her shell and makes another record because she's amazing. She's absolutely incredible. That wow. album we called Through These Walls, you could buy it for 50 cents on Amazon. Wow. Buy it. It's a killer, killer, killer record. It's, another what's, thing what's that's her name like again? Hillary? Hillary McRae. Uh, M, Hillary with one L, M C R A E. Uh, one of the big things that killed her too is that uh, Sarah Bareilles came out around the same time. Sure. And Adele, and uh. that's the thing. She kind of sunk. Her and Diane Birch uh, were two great artists. That that and, and, and uh, Nicole Atkins. Those three artists should have been huge, but they were all, you know, dwarfed by Adele, Amy Winehouse. Sarah Bareilles, Katie Tungstall, and you know, so many great artists. Aslan was another great one that I love from the 90s and 2000s that should have made it, but there was just too many similar artists. And again, the record industry was still operating while on fire. Yeah, that's so, a good way to put I've never heard, heard it put like that, but that is a great way to put Yeah, it. oh sure, we'll sign you. Hey, yeah. is, is the building on fire? No, never mind the smoke. Don't worry about it. We're good. Yeah. We're fine. We'll get that out. No. Yeah, the whole industry it was on was fire. And it, never, and it never put the fire it's out. The problem. But here's the cool thing about the industry now is that you no longer have to be on a major label to get worldwide distribution. Absolutely. Unfortunately, there's a thousand albums being released daily, especially now. And it's hard to, to float up to the top. So you got to be creative. So yeah. viral video is a big thing. Uh, live streaming, um, you know, internet presence, blogging, GoFundMe's and stuff like that. You know, it's really interesting. But that was pretty low. Again, I was really disappointed a few times, uh, but it never stopped me. When I get, when something blows up in my face, instead of stewing and like, drinking or you know uh, becoming a depressed person i just move on to something else yeah and i'm Which a chameleon a, a much healthier way to handle that great way to any do of the it. things you uh, just mentioned so it's a great yeah. way to do it um give me your uh guitar wise give me your top three guitars like what's your primary guitar and what other two because you mentioned a bunch okay. of okay nine okay so i guess the question is if your place was on fire, what would be the first three guitars you grab? That's a good way to put it. Number one, 1972 Fender Mustang. Modified to Todd Rundgren spec. What is Todd Rundgren spec? The Mustang has two switches that do on and out of phase. Those are taken out of the circuit. A three-way Gibson switch is put on the lower bout. So it's switched like a Gibson. So you have two, a volume tone and you have a three-way switch so it keeps it very simple yeah it also has fender red lace sensors in it okay which is I, one of my favorite pickups a lot of people poo poo those it, the red lace sensors sound like noiseless strat pickups sure with a nice little mid-range hump that guitar screams another thing that's cool about the mustang is that it's a, a short scale neck so i put 11s on it and it feels like 10s Gotcha. And it's great, very slinky. The best vibrato bar ever. I mean, the most, it's touch sensitive. Um, mine stays in tune because I put some graphite in the nut mm -hmm. and it, it, it's my right arm. I mean, I mean it, I, it's one of the few guitars I could play full shows on. And it's been all over the world. It's been thrown around, it's been stolen and I returned it and I got it got stolen from my car once and I was able to get it back because it's covered in, it's got stickers on it. It's got, um, uh, some markings. Todd Rundgren signed it. Oh, and, and somebody noticed it. And yeah. Told, they noticed oh. it. They're like, Oh, sorry. And I was able to get it back, which is great. Okay. So that's my number one. Right. Number two, my 82 telly, the one I played on the Christian Castro record. Mm -hmm. I call it my lucky telly. And, uh, it has Fender noiseless pickups in it. It's an 82 um, Fender uh, Fullerton reissue. And when I bought it, somebody had decided that they wanted to play Eddie Van Halen on it. So they put a Kaler Wang bar in it and two humbuckers. And I ended up getting it taken back to spec. 
It had a huge swimming pool route underneath the Kaler that got filled out with some wood. Oh, okay. And uh, that guitar is some of my clients' favorite guitars. Um, it just sings. And it's got that telly thing, but it also has like a really big bark. And when I play Questions live, I play the Eric Clapton solo, and I play it on that. And it, man, every time I play that solo, and I play it my own version of the Eric Clapton solo, the crowd erupts. I mean, they go nuts. That's cool. And that man. guitar just sings. There's a video on YouTube of me playing Questions with, uh, with the Echo and the Canyon Band, and that, that just sings, man. I mean, it, it, that, that thing blows my mind every time I play it. Um, and then my number three would be my 1966 Gibson SG which I inherited from the family of Mingo Perez. Mingi was a guitar player for a guy named uh, Willie Chirino, a big Latin salsa star. But he was a huge Beatle nut, and we played in a Beatle band called the Beat Hose back in Miami. He passed away, and his family gave me his first guitar, which was a 66 SG. That was very nice. When I moved to, when I, when I went to, to England to go record at Abbey Road, I took that guitar and I said, Mingi, you finally made it to Abbey Road. There you go, man. That's cool. And there it is. When I, when I went to Abbey Road, I put up pictures of all my, my uh, passed on people, my mom, my dad, um, my old friend from high school, Jose. Oh, you wound up losing your mom when you, and back when you took care of her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Passed away right before I moved to LA. Wow. But, uh, you know, that was the thing that kept me in Miami. So taking care of my mom. I had some family stuff down there. But I moved out here and I took off like a rocket. This was the place to do it. But yeah, those the, that would be number three. And then 3.5 would be my uh, <laughs> 68, 68 uh, Gibson Country Western Acoustic, which I write all my songs on. And uh, that thing is beat the crap, but it, it always inspires me to write songs, even though it's, it's definitely afraid right now because I just got a 1970 D28. It's afraid. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's going to kill it in its sleep. It's going to be like, I'm going to be sleeping. I'm going to hear like noise and it's going to be the, 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 the D28 in pieces and the, the Gibson going, <laughs> I did it, I did it. But those guitars sound great together because the Gibson acoustic has that mid range. It's great strumming guitar, but I always grew up on that, on that Crosby, Stills and Nash acoustic sound. And that's the D28. Right. And I love it. So good. And give me your, uh, Fernando, give me your top three Desert Island discs just for right now, because I know that would change any time. War Babies, Hollow Notes. Todd Rundgren's Utopia, the first album with the eyeball on the cover. Yeah. Number three, Jason Faulkner's Author Unknown. Wow, no one's ever given me any of those records. That's cool. There you go. Yeah, there man. you go. I mean, I mean, look, top, I could easily give you top 10, Abbey Road, um, Todd Rundgren's Hermit of Milk, Mink Hollow, Jellyfish's Spilt Milk, The Cardigans, uh, Emmerdale, um, Mahavishnu Orchestra's Visions of the Emerald Beyond, John Luke Ponty's Enigmatic Ocean, um, Kate Bush's The Kick Inside, um, freaking so many records but then i would miss so many i'd be like <laughs> you know god how am i gonna live without gino vanelli's uh night walker album gino vanelli that's I, funny yeah he's yeah, one of my man. favorites yeah he's a and, very you know, popular i love that stuff you know but yeah i mean there's so many records that i would just hate to miss you know yes the yes album um flash out of our hands um god uh uh, just so many records that I would just be like, you know, Michelle Legrand's uh, uh, Umbrellas of Schoberg uh, soundtrack. Um, Tori Amos's uh, from, the, from the Choir Girl Hotel. Sean Lennon's Friendly Fire. Um, Fiona Apple's title. The Grays, Rochambeau. You, you get cut off. You got <laughs> to... Uh, the, yeah. Gray, the Grays, Rochambeau. Just, no, Tori just... Amos from the Choir Girl Hotel. Um, so many. I mean, yeah. I, the, God, the Gray's Rochambeau is the Bible of alternative guitar in the last 20 years. Because that's John Bryan, Jason Faulkner, 
Buddy Judge. And those three guitar players are huge influences on me. I go to see John Bryan every Friday I possibly can. Uh, he does once, uh, once a month he plays Largo. Well, back when there was live shows. God. And uh, <laughs> he, does one, he does his one-man thing. And um, he plays a Gaia tone uh, that has the most amazing sound with a Bigsby. And it's just like his so many tricks that I've learned from Jason Faulkner and John Bryan. The octave bending, the, uh, the, the vibrato bar work, the Neil Young type, we, and then all the like melodic stuff, you know. Those are the, I would say my biggest guitar influences are Todd Rundgren, George Harrison, Jason Faulkner, John Bryan, Daryl Sturmer, um, Peter Banks, Peter Banks, the original guitar player in Yes, who played in a band called Flash in a band called Empire, which, funny enough, I, am, I have a new band called The New Empire with the original drummer of Empire, where we're doing a record that's a tribute to Peter Banks. Oh, that's new cool. Music. And, uh, you know, Steve Howe is a huge influence on me. He's my favorite slide guitar player. Great. Um, you know, and, I had uh, Daryl Sturmer, I had him here on the show, but he, and we got to meet shortly after that because he was playing down here. He, he's one of the nicest, genuine human beings you'll ever meet man he's a very and unfortunately guy. he's 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 in a t the tough position that he had to replace steve hackett in genesis and yeah. you know he came in with a different style one of the things that's interesting about genesis is that phil collins was never really a, a progressive rock guy he was more of a rock and soul and funk guy and, which you could tell but, from listening to any phil collins record yeah <laughs> and when he brought in guys for genesis he brought in guys that are records that he liked so he brought in Chester Thompson because he was a huge fan of Tower of Power, Weather Report, and Frank Zappa. Sure. So he brought in, you know, an unheard of African American drummer in Prague, and he ended up becoming great. And then Daryl Sturmer he brought in because he was a huge fan of of uh, John Luc Ponty, and Daryl's all over Enigmatic Ocean, Aurora, yes. Cosmic Messenger, and um, he also played with uh, Gino Vanelli on the Brother of the Brother tour, which. And him, he also, yeah, and he also played um, keyboard player. I'm having a, uh, I think he played with George Duke as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But um, uh, but yeah, Daryl's a huge fan. Um, he led me on my addiction to the Hagstrom Swede, which uh, <laughs> I own too. And uh, I also have one of the rarest Hagstroms, which is the uh, the Jimmy, which is the Jimmy Tequisto, which is basically a Hagstrom Swede hollow body. Okay. And those old Hagstroms have their own sound, man. I've it's like a Les Paul them. with clear pickups. It's like, okay, it's everything you love about a Les Paul, plus it stays in tune, and it's got clarity because the pickups are very hi-fi. Right. And I like clarity because I'm a very chimey player. Sure. And if you listen to all those old John Lou Ponty records, Daryl had his own thing going on. And... uh you know, Alan Holdsworth joined for Enigmatic Ocean, but Alan didn't only played solos on that record. Daryl held the meat of the potatoes of the guitar on that. And that's some of the best guitar playing I've ever heard. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, he's the man. But, you know, He's also a Godin guy. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And uh, he's incredible. I love him. Love him. Um, tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Well, I'm sexy as hell. Uh, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I. You uh, don't like that about yourself, probably the most. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the deal. Here's the deal, Craig. The thing I like the most about myself is my ability to bounce back and my ability to evolve. And also, I'm really good with like under pressure. Um, I don't have any stage fright. Um, the only time I ever have stage fright is if there's any like stuff that's beyond my control, sure. gear stuff or, you know, uh, uh, weather or whatever, or another musician freaking out or whatever. I, I generally work best under pressure. I've been put in some very bizarre positions like, all right, hey, uh, you want to play guitar on Tempest Fujit uh, with, with, uh, with, with uh, uh, Jeff Downs on keys? You got a day to learn it. Oh my God. Okay. I'll do it. You know, boom. Uh, hey, 
Steve Hackett wants to play on stage with us, but he forgot the song. Can you teach him the song again? Sure. It's fine. I've had some crazy experiences where I've been last minute, you know, on stage in a position that I didn't know about or, or had done a session that I wasn't prepared for. But I, I think one of the things that definitely have made me who I am is my ability, my ability to take direction, my ability to, um, my ability to, uh, what's the word? Uh, adapt to any situation and also work with pe other people. Like I've been, I've been on sessions where I'm one of two guitar players and the other guy is, you know, I, I see what the other guy is doing and I'm like, I'm going to find the hole to be myself and not overshadow anybody. Right. You know, I also play to the song. I, um, I can be over the top, but I, uh, I generally take the approach that will most serve the song. Which, I've got the top, client, which all the top pros do. I've got a client that, that is, uh, is amazing, but I call him the contrarian because I'll send them a solo and be like, everything's good but the solo. You just played the melody. I want you to shred. And I'll be like, I played the melody because your melody is good. He's like, no, I don't want you to copy me. I want you to, I want you to play more intense. Be like, oh, okay. And then he'll say stuff like, I want you to play a solo underneath the second verse. I'm like, but that's going to battle the guitar vocal. I'm like, I don't think my vocals are that good on that verse. Can you like, you know, mask it? They're like, oh, okay. But it ends up sounding good, but that's not the way I work. Right. I like, right. To, stay away. I like to stay out of the way. Yeah. And I like to play to the song and I like to arrange my guitar parts so that they're not um, showboating or anything. Yeah, of course. However, when I do get asked to showboat, I showboat. I mean, you have to. Yeah. I mean, I could, I could, I could do stuff that will blow people's minds, but it's just like a lot of it is not typical. I'm not a shredder. I'm not, I've never been influenced by guys like Eddie Van Halen and Steve Vai and Joe Satriani. I've been more about the power of one note. One of my biggest influences is Carlos Santana. Oh, in funny. fact, he was one of my first influences. And he taught me that four notes played with passion are better than a hundred notes played with precision. Yeah. I'm the, I like, I'm a Gilmore guy for that same reason. Oh yeah. 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 David yeah. Gilmore is a big influence. Neil Young's a huge influence. Um, another one of my biggest influences is uh, a guy named uh, Ian, uh, Ian Barnson, who was a guitar yeah. player on Parsons Project. Right. He also played in Pilot, and he played on the first three Kate Bush records. B A I R N. I think. Yeah. 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 B A I R N S O N. I think it is. Yeah. One of the greatest of all time. Huge influence on me. And Todd Rundgren's the same way. I mean, he could overplay, but he chooses not to, and he always finds the note that'll hit you in the chest and go. Wow, that that just hit me. That's great. He's always always too loud too, so it's all good. <laughs> but he's the man. Um, other guitar players that hit me like that, man. I mean Neil Young. Come on, you know, talk about milking one note until it's, yeah, yeah. It, it, it just sticks out. You know, Mike Campbell. Love Mike Campbell. Um, uh, there's 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 non guitar players that have influenced me. I'm a huge fan of Ben Folds. I'm a huge fan of uh, of Billy Joel. Um, I, I'm also a drummer, so drumming has changed my entire approach towards guitar. I'm very rhythmic. Um, Adrian Ballou is a big influence. I do a lot of behind the nut and behind the bridge stuff. Right. And uh, I also have been a big fan of like uh, kill switches and uh, you know that type of stuff. And I love rhythmic stuff. I'm also Cuban, so. I have a big vocabulary in Latin uh, music, so um, I can approach guitar playing almost from a percussion aspect. Even I could just like just mute the strings and and play a part, and it could be a percussion track. Right. I've also used guitar as bongos before. Uh, Stephen Stills, uh, there's a track that he used a guitar as a bongo before, and I'll just turn my country western and play bongos on it. And that's a great sound, you know. <laughs> When you were doing the Latin stuff, did you ever work with an engineer called Benny Facconi? Sounds familiar, but I didn't. Yeah, okay. He's a guy who did a lot of work on those in that genre during that period of time. 
Yeah, I worked a lot with Sebastian, Chris, um, and uh, I worked a lot with Lilia Stefan, John Merchant, uh, Chris Rodriguez, C. Rod, um, and uh, yeah, it was an incredible experience. Uh, tell me that you don't. You probably don't have any hobbies outside of music. I wouldn't imagine you have any time. Uh, record collecting, um, guitar. <laughs> 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 I'm a little bit of a guitar addict. I own a lot of guitars, and I love them. You know, drives my girlfriend crazy, but I pay the bills, so it's all good. But there still, you go, I've got um, I've been very lucky. I've got some really nice ones, but I uh, most of my guitars are oddball. I've been uh, completely in love with this uh, Aria Diamond uh, uh, telecopy that I picked up at Guitar Center for 150 bucks. But it was made in the in the, in the Fujigen factory, and it sounds great. It's got Grovers, stays in tune, really, really cool. Um, I love oddball basses. You know, I've got a prototype Gibson Ripper that my friend gave me. It's one of the first five ever made before oh, cool. the Bill Lawrence pickups. Amazing sounding bass. Probably still has the original strings from the 70s. <laughs> but sounds incredible. I love... Uh, Parlor guitars, Stella parlor guitars, uh, you know, really fun stuff. Um, Squires, I love Squires. I, my one of my favorite go-to guitars in the studio is a Squire Jazzmaster. It sounds great. I've got a lot a Jaguar. of people play them. Yeah, they're fun. My, yeah. my my number one bass for sessions is an '83 Squire P bass with flat ones on it. Never out of tune. Plays great all around and always sits in the mix perfect. You right know. On, man. It takes a lot uh, of work to get my rocker sounding good, but the, the Fender, always perfect. Yeah. Hey, uh, two more questions, and I really Go appreciate your time. Tell me the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, and how much of that change has been intentional, and how much is just a natural part of aging? I learned, that, I learned that to listen more and talk less. I think I also learned to uh, appreciate what I have. And uh, I got less jealous. I never had a jealousy issue, but I definitely, I didn't let other people's, you know, careers affect mine. Less, com you compared, you stopped comparing yourself to other people, in other words. Yeah, yeah. man, that's an important and thing. And also yeah. one of the main things I'm working through is, is, and uh, is is uh stop living in the past and stop thinking what if you know one of the best pieces of advice i ever heard is there's only today and tomorrow you know the past is the past and it's past yeah man so you know there's nothing you could have done to save situations that didn't go you gotta you gotta work towards making a better tomorrow that's the key yeah and you only do that right now man yeah and uh, last question, Fernando. What is the most important lesson life has taught you? Wow. This is the debut of that question, actually. I've never asked that question before. Be kind. That's treat awesome. others the way you, treat, you want to be treated yourself. And also, open yourself to new experiences and encourage people. Live by example. Um, I have a lot of friends in Miami that are rooting for me and are so excited. Uh, since Echo in the Canyon came out, I've gotten so many text messages from old school friends and saying, wow, Fernando, you're doing exactly what you wanted to do. That's awesome. You follow your heart and you're now doing exactly what you set out to do. You know? There's and you took a lot of risk. And you took risk. And you can't do that without taking risks, man. So. Uh-huh. But also, you, you for that. do that. You can't do that unless you have a healthy head. And it's like, you know, part of what's kept me doing this is staying away from vices and staying away from drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and and um, also letting yourself letting letting opportunities come to you as opposed to you know being overly aggressive. You know, I don't how to people anymore you know I'll say hey man i haven't been in your studio in years what what's up 
I just let the calls happen. Yeah, right. Except for that first one, which was awesome, man. Well, that, that was that was, was, was kickstarted your whole career. I had nothing to prove there. You know, I, yeah. I, had, I had nothing. Nothing I had to nothing, lose. Nothing Only to lose. upside. Yeah, it yeah. was great. I, I also, it was definitely a time of, uh, of uh, it was, it was uh, a do or die moment for me. Yeah. So, you know, and I still work with Chris. Um, that's so still, cool. One of the things that's also really important is to be the, the ability, especially these days where we're all in lockdown, the ability to do your work from your house, the ability God, to yeah. do session work and have a great sound and send it all over the world. You know, I'm, I'm collaborating with two different artists in Japan right now. Elizaveta, who was an artist who was on Universal, who's now living in Japan. We're making music together. And then the new empire, Mark Murdoch, is over in Japan. So I'm sending files from Winnetka to Japan daily. I'm producing artists in Miami. I produce five different artists in Miami where they just send me their vocals and scratches. I record an entire band's worth, send it back. They record their vocals and send it back. I mix it. Albums come out. That's I've done awesome. That Brian J. Klein that way. I'm producing a guy named Justin Autry that way. I've done uh, three albums for uh, Jean, Jeannie Partridge, uh, Bill Hartman, who I've been working with. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, I love working that way. Um, gives me all the freedom too, because I don't have the artists right here going, try something different. You know, no, no, I'll send them down and be like, hey, do you like this? Yeah, like, that's cool. You and know, you do, I love working. do mixing as well? Yeah, I do mixing. I do, I know I'm not as good as Zach Ziskin, who's my number one. Uh, he's also in Miami. He's an incredible dude. But I, I mix a lot of the stuff I do because of budget constraints. Sure. But is there mastering uh, or not? Not on much. Yeah. Oh, there is. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Zach, Zach does most of my mastering. I okay. also does mastering. I work with IK Multimedia, so I use the Lurston mastering software. Sure. I use T Rex and stuff like that. So I've had stuff that's come out. It's done great. I get played all the time on Sirius XM radio on the some stations all over the world, and stuff sounds great. You know, my studio is set up always for the best fidelity possible i and, like that uh, wood there man i love that old wood that you have up on on this yeah, well, it's this so is cool looking man converted garage that's awesome i i've been lucky i've been very lucky both places i've lived in la have had a great drum sound and uh i also love miking amps and cranking them you know i've got um uh, i've been I'm, I'm now endorsed by magnetone uh, oh, cool with Ed, and I've, i have a twilighter that I run into a legend cabinet that's in the closet. The old legend amps. The that's old awesome. Billy Gibbs, all birch design cabinet with a 112 EV, a 100 watt EV, which is great. Because I actually, I like my distortion to come from my pedals, actually. I, uh, I don't, I rarely use amp distortion. Oh, that's um, interesting. I also learned very That's early. really interesting. That's totally contrary to the whole, everything else that you're doing. Uh, my, writer, my writer has one thing no marshall anything but marshall really why because i don't know what to do with myself if the amp is dirty if the amp is clean it's a big large palette with a full sound spectrum sure i understand if the amp is dirty if i hit my game pedal if i hit my boost pedal it doesn't go up in volume my right. solos get drowned out also it's too loud and it's just too it's it's <sighs> that's the sound of a marshall to me my favorite live amp, aside from my Twilighter, is a Music Man RD50 combo with a 112 EV. I love EV speakers. The reason I like EV speakers is that they don't distort. When you have a speaker that's distorting like a Celestian 30, it, lo it becomes compressed. It's a compressed sound. So the volume can't go this way. The, the, the audio can't bloom. I like a blooming guitar sound. So what I do is I have a clean amp. I put the Jekyll and Hyde. I always have the green channel on, and then my red channel is my lead tone. My crunch comes from a converted tube, tube screamer, uh, which is one side, and that's always a little bit hairy. So I have a little bit of that stuff, and then the lead tone is, is nice and fat with a big sustain. And um, I don't really have a clean tone. My right. clean tone is somewhat dirty, you know, but I love the sound of an amplifier that's not breaking up. Yeah. I always joke that I'm like, I'd rather have a JC120 than a Marshall. I'd, I'd even take a, uh, um, a PV, uh, Classic 50. I love those. You know, I like amps that have a nice clean sound to begin with. Fender Twin, right. you know. 
Fender Fender Deluxe. Not so much a Princeton because those break up because they're very the ten speaker gets a little funky. But my clean tone is clean. Right. You know, but I always have that that Jekyll and Hyde on. And recently I've been turned on to some clone stuff. Mm. I love clone. I have a clone clone that sounds incredible. There's a I bunch of them out there, man. That's a very yeah. heavily I, I love yeah. fuzz. Uh, yeah, I love fuzz. I love Leslie. I'm working with Hammond now. Uh, I've got their Leslie pedal, which sounds incredible. Uh, I love the micro vibe. I'm just looking at my pedal board right now. I love the micro vibe by Google Labs. I love the Phase 90. Every pedal board I've ever had has at least one Phase 90. At one point, I had two. So I wanted to have the slow and the fast speed. Right. Um, I love Spring Reverb. The Boss. Spring yeah, it Reverb. sounds good. I love Spring. I like Reverb. Um, I love that stuff. My other main amp is a high watt. Uh, I have a high watt, a new chai watt, which is a Chinese high watt. It's uh, a chai watt. That's so funny because they're made yeah. out of in England. So now they're making them in China. They're making them in China, and it's a high that's watt. That's wild. A chai watt. <laughs> and uh, they are, they were not allowed to sell the high watt name in the states, so it's a max watt. But I was able to get a high watt. Facebook. Oh, because yeah, but okay, they had some big legal thing there. I remember Fernandez spoke still to them. High watt. Okay. Which is weird because Fernandez is a Japanese company. Yeah. But this high watt is only 20 watts, but it gives me that David Gilmore tone. Right. And it's very clean and it sounds incredible. Great reverb. And I love that. And I have a Fender Pro Junior that I like too, which is cool. It's like a little 110. Uh, and I use that for Echo in the Canyon because we're a very low volume on stage. Sure. And it gives me that tweed tone. Uh, the, the main amp I used on Echo in the Canyon, see, Andy Slater is a guitar collector, an amp collector, and I used everything from a real 59 burst to his 6120, to his uh, 55 Strat, to his uh, uh, Firebird 1, you know, his big Clapton head, so he's got all the cool Clapton heads. Yeah. Well, I played through um, a very interesting, very, very interesting amp. Um, it is a... Uh, holy shit. Why, why am I, why am I, why am I blanking on this really quick? Hold on. It was a, it was a definitely a, 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 a off the wall amp. Uh, we'll go back to that, but I, I used, I used a, a really interesting amp that sounded great. Uh, another amp I used was a Watkins Dominator, which is a lot of fun. Oh yeah, those are cool. Yeah, the weird, really, funny shape. Really, really, really cool. Uh, but yeah, old amps are fun, you know. Uh, that was actually interesting because like, uh, one of the first things he said, no pedals, you know, like if we went distortion, let's just turn the amp up. And that was a new thing for me. Uh, a lot of, also a lot of Fender, a lot of the Fender uh, reverb tank, you know, which is great. Well, that, that Watkins stuff. Dominator is supposed to be great with breakup. Yeah. Well, it's, it's sort of what the Marshall was based on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. The, um, oh, we didn't get to my school stuff. We did not. Um, do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, go ahead, man. Um, okay, so, um, well, one of the things that changed my life was uh, I went to a high school called Miami Beach Senior High School, and uh, we had a teacher named Doug Burris, who was my mentor. And what made him different than every other guitar teacher in the world was he's, he was quadriplegic with multiple sclerosis. So, so quadriplegic means he had, he had no no use of his arms or legs. He was in a wheelchair. And how, he do you, guitar. how do you move around? And does he like have control of his fingers to move the wheelchair or something? No, no. He had he had always he had students helping. Okay, but he could teach guitar using uh, nothing but but his vocal his words, and he could talk you through anything. And he also had you know senior students that could help show demonstrate stuff. But he always said. Classical guitar is the backbone of what you're going to do. And then we had this thing called Rock Ensemble, where uh, I did, uh, we did Sgt. Pepper as a show. We made our own album. And, uh, 
we were like a cover band and I got to learn all the ropes of playing live, you know. I had my first gear failures. I had my first string breaking, you know, bring a, bring a backup, always bring a backup. I learned all the good stuff. And by the time I was out of high school, I was already a pro. I had already right. done real shows and toured because we played all over the country. So, you know, that was an invaluable thing. And all my records are dedicated to Doug. That's really uh, cool. He passed man. away a few years ago. Uh, and he actually, one of the best things is that I, I violated my, uh, my do not discuss uh, Echo in the Canyon contract by playing him the record before he passed. And he started crying and he's like, you did it, Fern. You finally did it. You know, that's so exactly cool. What I wanted you to do. And it's great. You know, Tell, what's the most important thing you learned from him? You're an entertainer first. He used to do this thing called the Golden Pickle Award. That's whoever moved around the least. He says, don't be a pickle. <laughs> you know, you're an entertainer. Move around. Entertain. Show That's great, people. man. Important you know? lesson because people don't and, realize that. Yeah, you're in the entertainment yeah. business, man. I'm not into guys that are sitting there reading an iPad all day, you know, or, or sitting down or whatever, you know. I like putting on a show. That's my thing. Hey, uh, let me tell people where to find you. And thank you so much man i appreciate it it's um, a real pleasure thank you same here man uh and you got a great reputation amongst everybody you've worked with because i've had thank so many people mention you to me yeah just awesome everybody. man no seriously yeah, jj like, blair jj blair is uh yeah is the other, he, you know he was the guitar player that i started filling in for uh at the kibitz room oh that that's stuff. funny yeah he, yes, he jj is a big fan of me huge yeah, fan of yours he's also he's also you know what's great about jj is that He's got no filter, so he'll tell you when there's something that, he, that, that could be better. And I remember him saying, you know, I'm so glad you got that SG, man. That Mustang is great, but it's like, I always hear you with humbuckers, man. And I'm like, you know, okay, cool. Everyone's got an opinion, but that opinion actually was very valid. My voice changed completely when I started playing the SG more. Oh, that's you awesome. Know? He's a big fan of Mahogany. He's a big fan of Gibson. He even just started a Gibson uh, fan page on Facebook that's all like, only pre-70 Gibsons, you know? That's so and, funny. Uh, it's a really cool thing, which is funny because I love Norland Gibsons too, but I, I'm a weird oddball, man. You know, if anybody has a Travis Bean for under 3000 it's mine. Yeah, contact Fernando. Let me tell you how to do that. Uh, first of all, um, to listen to his music, uh, go to fernandoperdomo.bandcamp.com. It's Fernando. Yeah. I don't need to spell that out. Perdomo is P-E-R-D-O-M-O -O for you cigar smokers, spelt the same way as Perdomo cigars. <laughs> uh, um, also, uh, Fernando has a very cool Patreon at uh, patreon.com forward slash Fernando Perdomo. You want to talk about what you offer there? Yes. Um, so I'm doing this album called Creatreon. It's 52 tracks, one track a week. And it's an instrumental guitar album. And it's some of the best stuff I've ever done. And the only way to hear it is on the Patreon page. Also, I'm giving them exclusives. Like uh, every Thursday, I'm posting something from my archives that's never been posted before. Like I posted recently a uh, a theme song for a casino that was uh, rejected. You know, <laughs> that's um, funny. cool like outtakes and weird versions of songs. And also, I post everything I release four days in advance on that page. Oh, that's cool. So it's a really I got 25 patrons right now. I'd love to get it up to 50 because it's it's great money. It's also a really cool way of fan experience, you know? Yeah. So check that out at patreon.com forward slash Fernando Perdomo. If you want to connect with Fernando for either tracking or production, there's a few different ways to do that. Uh, you can go to his website, which is just fernandoperdomo.com, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, or you can go to Fiverr, which is F-I-V-E-R-R.com. And he's on there as well. Uh, also you can connect with him on social media on Instagram. It's Fernando Perdomo guitar on Facebook and YouTube. It's Fernando Perdomo music. And you could su subscribe to those, uh, his YouTube channel as well. And on Twitter, it's F Perdomo. Yep. Um, anything I missed, man, anything else you'd like to, to I offer? Just the, answer, the Armand, the Armand, um, is the Armand R R 10, Hold on, no, oh, that was the amp that you were playing? The amp I used on Echo in the Canyon, which I used. Oh, okay. I didn't know the Armand made amps. All I knew was that they yeah. made pickups. So they, they made amps in the, uh, in the 50s, in the 60s. Interesting. And they're considered uh, tweed fender killers. And they're really, really cool. R15. 
that amp kills, but it's on the used market. You can't get one for less than three grand because they're rare. That's but crazy, really, man. Really cool. Amp. 15 watt three amp, terminal. three grand. That's, you know, 60 years old. Wow. Yeah. Um, man, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Craig, this um, was a real blast, man. Thank you. Th thank you. For I wish you best of luck with everything. And you know what, man? I, I meant to tell you one thing. When I first contacted you, and I wanted to share this story, I contacted you because I think I saw a photo of you and your girlfriend or your wife, girlfriend? What? Yes. Okay. Girlfriend. And I said, my God, this couple looks so happy. And like, there was something about that photo. I was like, man, I really, and I looked, he's a guitar player and I said, I'd like to have this guy on my show. So I don't know what you're doing, but you seem like you my guys. Girlfriend, here's the cool there, thing man. about my girlfriend. Is she, she's a film editor. Mm -hmm. So she's creative, but there's no competition. Right. We also help each other out. You know, That's I've been cool. getting all editing gigs. She's been using my music and some of her edits. And uh, she's big time. I mean, she's, uh, she's an AFI grad, uh, American Film Institute, and she's been editing movies. And she edits, doesn't just do like commercials and, you know, whatever, independent stuff. She also does big time movies. And she just did a movie for Rhea Perlman. She just did a movie for Denise Richards. And uh, she's, she's definitely starting to hit a stride. Awesome, and it's unfortunate man. because she was about to do a movie that got canceled because of COVID. So oh. you know, her name is Cindy Trissel, cindytrissel.com. There you and go. Uh, hire her. She's the best editor I've ever seen. There you go. And she makes you happy. I could tell that from that photo. She's the best. <laughs> hey, man, thank her. you very much for everything. Hold on a second. Let me wrap this up. I really appreciate your time. Best of luck on all your projects, man. And I hope people. Thanks, Craig. Like You're the best, on. man. Thank you. you thank you. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Check out Fernando Perdomo. Let me go through the where he's at. You can find him on Bandcamp, Fernando Perdomo dot bandcamp.com support him on patreon patreon.com forward slash fernando perdomo and uh reach out to him through his website or through fiverr if you're interested in connecting with him for tracking or for production obviously if you're interested in tracking or production give him a detailed you know what makes you reach out to him what do you like about his playing or how do you feel he could help you you know give him something he could at least give you a, a, a response that makes sense with and uh, connect with them on social media and most important especially now during this quarantine time remember that happiness really is a choice so choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and have fun till next time peace and love everybody i am out thank you brother thanks craig